We are going to take a little, a little detour this evening. And I'm going to ask you to open your Bible to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, looking at the birth of Christ. I entitled the message, A Sinless Child is Born. It's incredible because you go through the Gospels. You, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all of us, all of them really pointing us to Jesus as the Messiah. But both Matthew and Luke give us some of the details of the events that had taken place prior to Jesus coming. Both John and Mark kind of very, very, very quickly, you know, pass through that uh, event. But we have in Matthew a very clear account of the events that were uh, given at the birth of Jesus. Luke is going to give us a lot more of that, and we're going to begin the Gospel of Luke sometime in January, and so we'll, we'll look at that as we get there. But I thought it was interesting as we're coming upon Christmas week and then now Saturday, Christmas Eve. Don't forget, guys, um, Saturday we'll have services at 4 and 6 Christmas Eve, and then we'll just have one 10 o'clock service on Christmas Day. So just so you're reminded, and, and I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll remind you again, but I, I know it's whenever there's a change like that, it sometimes gets confusing. So I just want to throw that at you. The first 17 verses of Matthew is the genealogy of Joseph. And one of the promises that God had given to the nation of Israel is that he would send them a savior and he would send them a king and he would send them someone who would come through the lineage of King David. Luke's going to give us the account through Mary's genealogy. Matthew gives us Joseph's genealogy. Even though Joseph wasn't his natural father, and that, that's what we're going to look at tonight, but you, you have here that even though he was a, his adopted father, he was the one who raised him in his home, he wasn't actually his biological father. But through both lineages, through both, through both lines, Jesus can be traced back to King David. And so that's what we have in those first 17 verses. What's interesting is that he jumps right in to the event in verse 18. It's almost without introduction. It's almost as though he just says, we're going to get straight to the point there in verse 18. And watch what he says. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child Check this out, of the Holy Spirit. Now, it's interesting that the Scripture wants it to be very clear of what was going on. And, and you, you, you realize that this betrothal period that he's talking about is something foreign for us. To be betrothed to somebody is something you and I go, what, what, what is he talking about, betrothed? Are they married? Are they not married? Is this like an engagement that's taking place? What's going on as, as Matthew tells us that there was this betrothal? A betrothal would happen after engagement. Children were picked to marry their partner at a very young age, mom and dad would, you know, get together with another friend's mom and dad and say, hey, why don't your kid my my kid? And, you know, I, I kind of like the idea. <laughs> Having four kids, you know, just kind of like, hey, I can pick these guys, you know, when they're young and kind of know what family they came from, know, know what kind of upbringing they have. I mean, that, that's, a, that's, that's pretty sweet. Now, if you're a teenager, you probably don't like that idea. Like, wait a second here. I don't get no say in the matter. But this is what was going on with Joseph and Mary. They, they were engaged from childhood. The, engage, the, the engagement would last until a year before the marriage, which would be called the betrothal period. And this betrothal was a time when the couple were known as man and wife, but they didn't have the rights of 
a husband and wife. They didn't have the marriage feast yet. And so it was really this really dating period where they really got to know one another and they now at this point um, are awaiting their wedding day and the, and, and the wedding feast. And it's at the wedding day, the wedding feast, it was after that that the marriage would be consummated. And so it's why it was, it was important that they make it very clear that before they were together, and, and, and Joe, you know, Matthew's going to make that point on several occasions in this, in this opening verses of Matthew, it, it, that before they were together, before they had any kind of intimate relationship going on, there was now uh, Mary with child and it tells us that she was found with child of the holy spirit and it's and it's interesting that he would tell us that uh you know just very very nonchalantly you know she she was she's she's got a baby in her womb but it was the holy spirit who uh who she was conceived by and then look, look what it says in verse 19 and joseph her husband being a just man and not wanting to put her away secretly. I, I'm sorry, and, and wanting, uh, not wanting to make a public example of her was minded to put her away secretly. That, that, that's how the passage goes. Now, now Joseph, and, and you have to read in between the lines here. That means at some point, Mary goes to Joseph and she goes, you know, I got something to tell you, Joe. I have a baby. I'm pregnant, but it's not what you think. Could you imagine that conversation? I, I, I don't think that went well. You know what I'm saying? It just, you know, you kind of, you know, Mary's trying to convince him that she, she's done nothing wrong. She hasn't cheated. She hasn't, she hasn't had any other relationship with any other man. And she, she's trying to tell him, look, God showed up. He spoke to me. He told me I was going to bear a child. And, I, and, and it, it had nothing to do with anybody else. And that happens somewhere between verse 18 and verse 19. Because by the time you get to verse 19, Joseph is looking how to break off the betrothal. And a betrothal wasn't just walked away from. It was a binding relationship. It was as though they were married. They had to go, actually go to the courts. They had to get a, a, an annulment or, or, or something of that sort in order to break this off. And, and what's, what's fascinating in, in all of this is that Matthew is emphasizing these things so that you and I understand that he, he's... he's having a difficult time understanding what's going on here. And I think sometimes we look at the Scripture and we, we, we don't understand that the, these are, are real people that are dealing with real situations and real dilemmas. And Mary and Joseph were dealing with a very, very real dilemma at this point. At least Joseph was. Ma- Mary was well aware of what was going on because an angel sp- spoke to her prior to this. Luke tells us. And J- Joseph is, is confounded. You know, this, this, you know, I've known this girl her whole life. She's, she's always been a, a very chaste girl. She's always been a very respectful young lady. And all, all of a sudden she comes and she's pregnant and she's trying to t- sell me this story. And he being a just man decides, I, I'm going to do it quietly and I'm not going to do it publicly because the consequence for adultery, and that's what it had been considered in, at, at this point, because they were already betrothed, would have been stoning. And, and so Joseph is going, man, you know, I, I don't understand why, I don't understand what, but I, I don't want to make a public example of you. We're just going to do this, and we'll do this quietly. You kind of go off to Uncle Fred's house. And, you know, I mean, it, it, was, it was something that they were trying, he was trying to figure out how to get out of this now without having her stoned to death deuteronomy lays out for us and we'll be getting through deuteronomy in the in the next couple months and and he lays out very clearly that if a woman is caught in adultery she's to be stoned and the man was to be stoned and 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 it's interesting that 
Joseph is wanting to do all of this in, in, a, in a very quiet way so that she wouldn't be stoned. I mean, I, I think that says something about his care for her and his love for her. And then it tells us in verse 20 that something supernatural happens. It's, very, it's there, he says, but while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. He says, jo- Joseph was pondering these things. He was going, you know, he, he's, he's really trying to figure out what, what am I going to do now and, and how is this going to look and what's this going to, how is this going to play out? And as he's on his bed thinking of all of these events and how he was going to respond to all of this, an angel comes on the scene and says, hey, Joseph, it's okay. Now, he addresses him as Joseph, son of David. It was those 17 verses prior that we took his lineage back to David. Meaning that he was part of the Messianic line. And he says that not only are you the son of David, but you you need to step up in the situation and not be afraid of of, of what, what's, what's ahead of you or what's gonna, what it's going to look like, what other people think. But he says, that this is what I desire of you. I want you to take to you, Mary, and I want you to continue in the relationship as husband and wife. Now, this picture that, that he's giving us is explaining that Mary has a child and she's still a virgin. And, and I think what the virgin birth is um, one, one, one of the, the great doctrines of the church that the scripture defines for us. And, and I, I think what, what one of the things it, it really does for all of us is it separates those who believe the Bible is God's word and those who don't. You see, if you can't believe in the virgin birth, it, that, that means you, you, you have to take this book and you have to discard it. Because everywhere in this book, it tells us that the Messiah would come in a supernatural way, and that he would become the sinless one who was able to pay the price for man's rebellion. And if you can't believe the virgin birth, man, that that, that means that everything that was written in the scriptures has no validity to it. Jesus isn't God. He isn't who he said he was. And therefore, everything that that you would put your hope in when it comes to Christianity is is taken away. And the sad thing, guys, is that many segments of of so-called Christianity are leaning toward that, that that there's no miracles, there's no virgin birth, there's no resurrection uh, in, in the way that the Scripture describes it. And what it takes is someone to put their confidence, their faith, their belief that God is bigger than man and and what's interesting about this whole event is that what what the scripture is defining for us is something that is supernatural for a baby to be conceived without anyone involved outside of uh, you know another male involved or, or you know that that there's any other possibility that she would still be a virgin after conceiving a child it takes great faith and it's what the scripture defines. And what the Bible does tell us is that Jesus' life didn't begin with his birth or with his conception. Jesus was 
from the beginning. In the book of John, chapter 1, in verse 1, John says it like this. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then he says, and the Word became flesh, and he dwelt among us. That Jesus just wasn't uh, another man. He, he wasn't just, just someone who, who uh, came as a good teacher or a good person. That Jesus is God. In the flesh. That Jesus is the one who was, took part in creation. That he's the one who holds all things together. And it's amazing because I, I think that this right here is going to divide those who consider Jesus to be a, you know, a, a good man, a moral man, a revolutionary, a prophet, or perhaps even uh, you know, this, someone that, that they would look up to. But what the Bible describes is that he's the son of God. Different, different than any other man that was ever come onto the face of the earth that's ever been born. He's the son of God. And I think that that, it, that is something that, that we, all of us need to, need to take into consideration as we celebrate his coming. And, and, and really what, what a virgin birth re really means, that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, what, what it really defines, he, it really gives us five, five points here. And what, what he wants us to understand is, number one, Jesus was born by the direct action of God. He was born by God's direct intervention into mankind. Number two, no man was involved in the process. Not Joseph, not a Roman soldier, not, 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 not a high school sweetheart, that, that there was no one else involved in this conception. It was the Holy Spirit. Number three, that Jesus had a human mother, but no human father. That, 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 that's what's gonna define for us that he was fully human and fully divine. Fully human in that he came forth from the womb. Fully divine in that the conception of that was by the Holy Spirit. And then fifthly, he was born without sin. You see, sin was passed through the blood. And it's at conception that the male is, is passing sin on to the next generation, to the next, to, to his seed, to his descendants. And that never happened with Jesus. He came as a supernatural intervention by God without sin. In the Gospel of Luke chapter 1, it, 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 it gives us kind of a, in, in the 35th verse, it, it's an interesting passage because he says that Mary was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. And, and, and one, one of the things that th that idea is is that, that it, was, it was God's presence that came over her. That same idea is used in the Old Testament in the tabernacle when they would go and worship God and it says that the presence of God overshadowed the temple so that no one could minister in the temple because God's presence was there. And it was that that Mary experienced. It was, it was God's presence in and around Mary overshadowed her. And Joseph is told 
that not only was this child conceived of the Holy Spirit, but in verse 21, man, th- th- this is amazing because he's gonna tell him why he's coming. Look what he says. And she will bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus, check this out, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus, the word Jesus means Jehovah is salvation. And Jesus would become the one who became the sin bearer, the sin payment. He would become the sacrifice for all mankind and for anyone who would call upon his name. And it's at the name of Jesus, the Bible tells us, that a person is saved and that there's no other name that a person can be saved by. Acts 4.12 says, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given amongst men by which we must be saved. You see, salvation, salvation is offered, and the only way it's offered is through Jesus Christ. That, that's why when Jesus is talking in John chapter 14, he says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. And we're living in a, in, in, in a culture right now that we, we, everyone, you know, we, we, to, to say that you can only come to God through one means, um, you know, is, is something frowned upon. That, that you're becoming, you know, discriminatory or you're, or, 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 or you're not open-minded. But, but the Bible very clearly states that there's only way, one way for a man to get to heaven and that's through Jesus Christ because it's only through Jesus Christ that sin could be satisfied. The payment for sin could be satisfied. And, and you, 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 you can't get to heaven through, through any other door or no other avenue or no, no other means. It, it, it's not by good works. It's not by anything we do or by calling upon some other deity that the only, there's only one way there and it becomes through Jesus Christ. It's the only name that can get you there. Amazing. Philippians in chapter two, verse 10, it says, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, those in heaven, those on earth, and those under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee, every tongue, every knee bow, every tongue will confess. Those in heaven, those on earth, and those under the earth. That, 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 he's, he's even talking about the ones in hell are gonna acknowledge that. In the book of John, chapter 20, and verse 31, John tells us why he even wrote the epistle, the, 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 the gospel of John. He says this, for there is, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Because the whole reason I wrote the Gospel of John, John tells us, is that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ and, and that is the Messiah the Savior, and in doing so, you may have life. It tells us in, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 23, he says, and this is the commandment that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. And then in 1 John five thirteen, he says this, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. And he, he, he constantly is laying out for us that it's believing in his name. And that word believe isn't, isn't just that it, it's something that you do with your head. It's something you do with your heart. That means that you put your confidence and your trust in what he's done and what he says. And it's incredible because he's wanting not only Joseph to understand what's happened, but he's telling Joseph the very reason that Jesus would come into this world, that he would become the one who would save us, that would save his people. 
And then notice what he says in verse 22. And so all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying, Behold, the virgin, shall, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, check it out, God with us. He's quoting Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. That means that the prophet Isaiah, 500 years before Jesus ever came on the scene, before he ever entered into this tabernacle of flesh and blood, it was already foretold that the virgin would give birth to a son, and that son would be named Emmanuel, which literally is God with us. Guys, and, and, and the, it is it's probably one of the most incredible events that's ever taken place in all of history. That God would become a man. That he would bear flesh and blood. You know, you, you, you just kind of, you know, try, try to wrap your mind around that. But here's, here's Mary, 15, the Savior of the world, God incarnate. As a little boy, I mean, I, I, you know, you just kind of like every time G Jesus is, is running down the street, you're like, you know, I'm responsible for him. She knew who he was. As he grew up as a carpenter. And, and, and now, you know, I, I, I'm sure not much different from today. You know, carpenters aren't kind of like what you would picture as the best, kindest profession. <laughs> I, I was a carpenter. I, I, I kind of have a, you know, a, a round carpenters. It, it's, it's, it's a different culture. And, and, you know, G G Jesus, you know, worked, labored, you know, sweated. I'm sure he hit his thumb a couple times. I mean, I don't know. I mean, just, I, I, I know this. I, I, th this thumb's been squished on many occasions. And, and, and to think that through all of this, man, Jesus was sinless. And... Joseph, hearing all of this stuff, that what had happened to Mary was the promise that Isaiah had given of a virgin giving birth. Now think about the faith that Joseph had to exhibit, you know, even if his, in his dream to, to acknowledge, man, that, that everything that Mary told me was, was legit, it was true. And, and now, it tells us in verse 24, and verse 24 is an interesting passage, it says, Joseph, being aroused from a sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and he took to him his wife. Joseph wakes up from that dream. And, and I, you know, I, I don't know how, how that conversation went between him and Mary, but, but he came to his senses and he says, and exactly what the Lord had told him is exactly what Joseph did. That at that moment, Joseph was well aware that he, the child was God. And Mary and Joseph had, you know, you, you, the conversations of, of were, we, we've been chosen to bear the Messiah. It's, it's interesting. Look at verse 25 in, in the, the end of chapter 1, and it says, and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son. And they called his name Jesus. 
He did not know her till. Now, did, does that mean that Joseph didn't know who Mary was? That term is specifically talking about sexual relations, the consummating of the marriage. And, and, and what, what amazes me is that in this passage, he, he once again affirms, look, Joseph had nothing to do you know, with consummating a marriage until after the child was born. And, and it's, it's an interesting passage. It tells us in 1 Kings, King David was old. He was advanced in years, it tells us in 1 Kings 1. They put covers on him and he could not get warm. Therefore his servant said to him, let a young woman, a virgin, be sought for our Lord the king and let her stand before the king and let her care for him and let her lie in her bosom, in your bosom, that our Lord the King may be warm. So they sought for a lovely young woman throughout all of the territory of Israel, and they found Abishag the Shumanite, and they brought her to the king, and the young woman was very lovely, and she cared for the king and served him, but the king did not know her. And, and that, that, that was the term that would be used to say he had not, this wasn't anything sexual. This was, this was purely a caretaker. And this same verbiage is used of Mary and Joseph. He did not know her. And, and, and I, I know growing up, I, I was taught that, that um, you know, not only was it a virgin birth, but Mary was a perpetual virgin. That means that she never, ever had any relations with Joseph even after the birth. But it's interesting that, that Matthew would tell us very clearly here, he says he didn't know her till after she had brought forth her firstborn son. And, and I think that that does two things for us, guys. I, I, I think, you know, acknowledging Mary was a godly young girl, and, and I think there needs to be honor and respect for Mary as, you know, those willing servant that she was in order to be obedient to the Lord and to fulfill her, her task in life, to, to bear the Messiah but I, I think the other side of that is, is that we can take Mary and, and, and elevate her into the same position as God. We do know in Scripture that Mary had other children. In Matthew chapter 13, in verse 54, it tells us, and when they had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, speaking of Jesus, so that they were astonished and they said where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works is not this the carpenter's son is not his mother called mary and his brothers james joseph simon and judas you see mary had other children those children came in after jesus was born and that, 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 you know, very, very clearly did the tell us in Scripture that James was the, the, the biological uh, son of Joseph and Mary. Matter of fact, in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 19, he says, And I say none of, none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother, did Paul speak to. And, and, it, and it, all of this kind of put together, you, you, you realize that in, within, within these passages that he wants us to understand that Jesus was not only a very unique child and, and uh, you know, uh, the Messiah, the Son of God, but that it was this event that would change the world. And, and Mary would become... Uh, you know, a, 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 a mother of, of, of other children, but it wasn't until after this event had taken place. Guys, I, I think of all of this as, because as we, as we go into the Christmas season, I think sometimes we, 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 we get caught up with just the, the event of it all with presents and food and we, we get caught up with, with all of the, the commercialization of it all and, and we forget that, man, not only is this an incredible time 
to remember what God's done on our behalf. That he loves us that much. That he would subject himself not only to the crib, but that he would subject himself to the rejection, to the brutal scourging, to the nails, to the thorn, to the spear. That he would go to the cross because of how much he loved you. And because of what it is that, that, that w- would be necessary for the payment of sin to be satisfied. In, 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 in the book of Romans chapter 5, let me ask you to turn there with me. There in verse 18. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. You see, it was Adam and his actions that brought forth sin. And that's why the Messiah could never come through a man because sin had tainted us. As a result of Adam's sin, you and I were condemned. And there was nothing that you and I could ever accomplish or do to get out of the condemnation. But it was one man's righteous act that brought forth justification through this one man, Jesus, going to the cross and dying for your sins, you have been declared righteous in the eyes of God. You've been declared sinless. And it's through what he had accomplished. It tells us in in another passage, that he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. He who knew no sin became sin. So that you and I could be righteous. It's substitutionary. That, 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 that's what the theological term is. It was substitutionary death. What you deserved, Jesus took so that you didn't have to pay that price and now your slate's been clean. And his substitutionary death was able and sufficient to pay for all sin, for all time. And you access that by faith as you call upon the name of Jesus and say, I'm the guilty one, God, and I deserve hell and I deserve condemnation. I, I, I deserve to forever be separated from you, but you took the price for me. And you were declared... as someone who's never sinned in the eyes of God.
And all because he was willing to step down from his position to become one of us. To take upon himself It would be later on in Romans chapter 8 that, that, that Paul would acknowledge that very fact. He says it in verse 1. He says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death and what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh check this out God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin he condemned Sin in the flesh. Guys, the greatest gift ever given was God sending His Son so that you don't have to be condemned and I don't have to be condemned. The greatest gift ever given was was that you and I can stand Righteous in the eyes of God. I I love that song we sang earlier. How can it be? You right my wrong. You're able to to, to take what I don't deserve and you're able to deliver it. Not, Not because God just looks the other way. It was because the payment was satisfied. And now there's no condemnation. The law could never do that. But God did it by sending his son to be the payment, the propitiation, the satisfaction of everything that you and I are guilty for. And therefore, you, 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 you and I don't have to walk around here any longer, guys, with, with, with this... Uh, with this, with our head down, with 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 the the the, the shame of, of our sin, you know, throughout throughout the week and throughout the year, and all of my failures, all of my faults, faults, we come and we confess, God, I I I messed up, and I need you, and I want to ask you to change me and transform me and to fill me with your power and the same power that raised Christ from the dead now lives inside of me, so that I'm not defeated by sin and I'm not ruled by sin any longer. And I'm walking in the Spirit, not in the flesh. I'm walking in, in, as, as a, it, this, this relationship between me and God now fixed so that now I can call upon Him to help me in my time of need. All, all, all because of this one event. My, my prayer for all of us, man, is, is we go into Saturday, you know, Christmas Eve and Christmas days, that that, that, would, that would be the, the thing we reflect upon. It would be the thing that becomes the center of our time together with family and friends that we remember that God loves us. That God loves us more than we can even fathom. And that we don't have to walk around Condemned. But we can rejoice in the great things that he's done for us. It's, a, it's, it's the... Most significant event that's ever taken place 
You know, I, 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 re I, remember, I remember going on 30 years now, 29 years ago. I, I, I remember the first Christmas after being born again, after understanding what this all meant. And it, it was, it was, it was the, the, the best Christmas ever. You know, I, there was a couple of great Christmases because I got some, you know, some cool stuff. <laughs> but, but then it was that Christmas that, that all this dawned on me. What God had done by coming into this world and taking upon himself what I deserved. And my prayer, again, just, man, let, let, let's, let's keep that at the forefront of our hearts. So, you know, I, I know some of you are still going, I, I got to get to the Albuquerque and get to the mall and buy this and do that and still got to spread some tamale and make the menudo or pasole or whatever it is, right? But, but you know, and that's, all that's fun and the, the tradition of it all and family, you know, that's all awesome, guys. But let's that, 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 make the reason for the season that Jesus came into this world because he loves me.